legislation and get it done so that survivors across this country get the help they need. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Indiana. Excuse me. Excuse me. Senator from Kansas. No, it's Indiana. <clears throat> oh, Senator from Indiana. Thank you. Uh, Indiana has a lot in common with uh, Kansas, and so I don't mind being labeled. I've, I've been in the chair, Mr. President, and made a similar mistake, so that's, that doesn't bother me. Uh, we do have a lot of similarities between Indiana and Kansas, and we hope that each of us has a Final Four team in the uh, basketball tournament uh, coming up in a few weeks for the Final Four. Uh, we've got some competitive teams, so that's, it's a nice, uh, nice blend. Uh, Mr. President, um, uh, I'd like to speak about uh, the sequestration issue that is facing us as a Congress here in the next few weeks. First of all, let me just say that I just returned uh, from the National Prayer Breakfast. Several of our colleagues uh, were there, uh, Senator Sessions, a Republican, and Senator Pryor, a Democrat, uh, representing Alabama and Arkansas, uh, but more importantly, co-chairs of the Senate Prayer Breakfast. Uh, uh, we led the effort today, both the House uh, Prayer Breakfast Group, which meets weekly, and the Senate Prayer Breakfast Group, which meets weekly, uh, uh, supports and, and really uh, uh, puts together uh, the annual prayer breakfast. People from more than 160 countries uh, attend, uh, people from all 50 states. Uh, it's quite a remarkable event. Uh, beyond the socialization and bringing people together um, around uh, uh, the, the issue of, of their faith and prayer, uh, we find this as we find on our weekly prayer breakfast meetings here in the Senate and the House, the one time when Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, people of no particular ideology get together and, and talk about the, the common interests um, on the basis of their faith. And it's always uh, very refreshing to do that, and the, it was a pretty remarkable session uh, this morning. The, uh, Senator Schumer from uh, New York uh, read a reading from the Old Testament, and Senator, our former colleague, Senator Dole from New, uh, North Carolina, read from the uh, New Testament. And Dr. Ben Carson, uh, head of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins University, recognized as uh, one of the world's leading, if not the world's leading pediatric neurosurgeon, uh, spoke to us for the second time. I heard him 16 years ago. Um, what a remarkable life story. Uh, what a remarkable uh, impact he had on the crowd that was there. Um, and uh, nothing changed. Uh, he talked about political correctness and uh, how it was detrimental to the kind of honest, straightforward debate we need in this country over uh, any range of issues, uh, from our religious beliefs to uh, all the way to our political beliefs, um, how we need to uh, be willing to be transparent and honest with the people that we represent, to speak out on what we believe, and, that the, and how healthy the, the debate is, even if we come to different positions in terms of, of, of separate issues. And so that's one of the reasons why I've been coming down here virtually every day since this Senate uh, uh, came back into session for the 113th uh, Congress uh, to talk about what I think is one of our, uh, if not the leading challenge facing us in this two-year term. I think without question uh, it, it is the impact on our people and on the economy, but more importantly on our people and the, the effects on the average family in America, the, the young people coming out of high school and college looking for a job, the, the impact that this uh, now more than four year economic malaise, starting with a deep, deep, deep recession, and now only getting to the point where our growth is far below what we need to get everybody back into a, to work and, and to get the economy moving again on a, on a good upward path. Uh, we're looking for the root of the problem and we're looking for solutions to the problem. And this body along with the House and along with the administration has been dealing with this now for well over uh, two years, uh, addressing, uh, trying to find the solution to get us on the right path to fiscal health. 
And we have taken several, made several steps in that regard, uh, uh, each one of which has come short. There have been several sort of uh, one step forward, uh, half a step back efforts, uh, but most of it has simply been pushing it down the road and trying, saving it for the big debate for another day. Well, back in uh, August of 2011, we ended up passing the Budget Control Act. Uh, tied with uh, the debt ceiling I issue. And out of that, um, the administration, uh, through that, the administration proposed, uh, President Obama proposed a measure which was designed to force the Congress to deal, to step up to the plate and deal with the real problem. And the real problem is a continued deficit spending at a level which we cannot begin to contemplate, um, which has to be addressed because it's accumulating year after year after year. We, we're now at the point where the clock is ticking at $16.5 trillion of debt that we've gotten into, up nearly $5.5 trillion uh, just the last four years. And the math clearly proves, um, and history clearly shows, that this is unsustainable. And this is the great challenge before this Congress, to do so what is necessary to get us on the right path to, to fiscal health before it all comes down. We had a warning shot fired across our bow in 2009 as to the distortions in our economy, and the consequences were grave. We have warning shots being fired virtually every day from across the Atlantic as to what the European Union and the European nations are trying to deal with because they allowed their debt and their deficit spending and their debt and their overpromises by politicians to their constituents that simply cannot be fulfilled. And now the money is running, the bank is running out of money. And we simply don't have the resources to continue to pay the debt and the interest on the debt. And it gets worse every day that goes by. So we've ha we had this, we had this uh, uh, Budget Control Act in 2011, which was designed, backed up by an enforcement mechanism called the sequester, which is simply an across-the-board cut, except the sequester wasn't an across-the-board cut. It was heavily weighted toward cuts in defense. Uh, there were exemptions to the major drivers of our debt and deficit, which are, is the, are the mandatory spending issues. Um, uh, let me be straight out, or, you know, say the things that you're not supposed to say because it's political suicide. If we don't reform Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, it doesn't matter what else we do, we can't solve this problem. That is the conclusion of just about everyone in this body. More importantly, it's the conclusion of everyone that doesn't have a political stake in, in mind. Uh, uh, analysts that look at this, economists that look at this, uh, the history of economic performance and non-performance all leads to the point that unless we address these issues and reform these issues, not to eliminate them, not to impose sacrifice and pain on people, but to save them from much greater pain down the road and to reform them so that they are viable and so that people who are contributing to their Social Security and to their Medicare payment, every paycheck, we look at the uh, deductions that goes into these programs, people are contributing to that, will be able to receive those benefits when they need them in retirement. And so to save that, those programs and to keep them from denying those people their hard-earned benefits, uh, we need to take steps, and we need to take it sooner rather than later. The trustees keep giving us of Medicare uh, and Social Security, keep giving us additional warnings. Do it now. It'll be less painful than doing it later, and it'll prevent us from having to, to make draconian cuts to benefits or draconian uh, increases in taxes that will break the back of the American taxpayer um, uh, later on. And so, unfortunately, the super committee that was formed, 12, six Republicans and six Democrats from each body, were unable to come up with a solution. And as a result of that, we have had this sequester across the board cuts with certain exemptions that, will, that uh, is in place. Now, it's been delayed. 
Uh, but March 1 is the date beyond which we are not going to go. And as a consequence, unless we can step up and put together the big plan that will get us on the path to fiscal health, uh, and Republicans in the, in the United States House of Representatives have been proposing and putting forth their plans, but we've had nothing coming out of this body, and because nothing can be accomplished unless there's support from both houses, this is going to fail. And frankly, we've had a lot of rhetoric coming out of the White House about what we need to do, uh, but we've had no serious attempt to address the part of the equation uh, that, that we all know needs to be addressed, and that's the excessive spending that over the years we have put in law, into law the promises that we have made as politicians to our constituents over the years that we know that cannot be fulfilled. It's time we stand up and be honest with the American people, uh, be transparent and basically say, folks, we've got a problem. And a simple math, you cannot continue to borrow a trillion or more dollars a year and be in a sound fiscal position. And you've got to take some steps to address that problem. So that is the challenge before us. And Mr. President, um, if we don't begin that process now, we are going to see a devastating across-the-board cut. Uh, it's going to have uh, very detrimental effects on our national defense and national security because it is so heavily weighted in that regard. And the major three contributors and drivers of the problem and the debt that it accumulates are the entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, that if not addressed, no matter what else we do here, we can't solve the problem. And yet the political tendency is to simply pass it along, push it down the road, let's get past the next election, let's, you know, it, it's, too, it, it's too politically dangerous to stand up and say these things, to be honest with the American people. Well, I think the American people have basically told us, look, um, uh, we're ahead of you. Uh, we understand the problem, and we want results. And we want you to work together to find a solution to this problem and put it before us. And it is our responsibility to go out and present the plan. But without the president's support, despite his rhetoric, I mean, all we hear from the White House is more taxes will solve the problem. Well, they just got $630 billion worth of taxes out of the fiscal cliff deal. And the president's uh, commitment uh, and obsession uh, with taxing uh, the rich, the, the job creators, uh, was fulfilled, and uh, the top percent, the people he uh, described uh, in his campaign and afterward in the negotiations, uh, are now paying higher taxes. But that is, does not begin and come close to solving the problem. So what we need to do is be straight out and straightforward with what it is we have to do, uh, not be afraid uh, of being honest with the American people. There's talk now about delaying, once again, the sequester. So whether it's the debt limit, whether it's the spending bills, whether it's the budget, whether it's whatever spending we do, whatever program is put in place, it's push it down the road, do it some other time, it's too painful to do now. Mr. President, I would suggest the time to do it is now. And if we, if, even though the sequester is imperfect, even though it imposes pain, more pain and more detriment to one of the essential functions of government, and that's providing for our national security, uh, it, it, it is, these cuts are going to take place and need to take place if we don't come up with a better solution. And so I'm pleading with my colleagues that it, let's not do this uh, in a way that uh, uh, is not the soundest way to achieve what we need to achieve. And by the way, the sequester, once again, uh, while it'll be an important step forward, uh, doesn't begin to deal with the real problem. The real problem is getting uh, our will uh, in the position, political will and courage uh, in place so that we can be honest with the American people and begin to put the package together that will reassure investors and reassure consumers and reassure uh, the world 
uh, that the United States of America has finally, finally taken the steps necessary to put it on a path to return to fiscal soundness. I think given our, our position as to where we are with other nations uh, would result in an amazing increase in our economy, uh, getting people back to work, um, sending the message that America can return to its place of leadership in the world because they have gotten their economic house in order. Without that, we will continue to decline. That will have consequences not only for our generation but for generations to come that could have potentially dangerous consequences for security around the world because of our inability to lead and could have serious consequences uh, continue as they have for the last four years for the young people and for the middle-aged and others who simply want to get back to work, who simply want to get back to a place where they get a paycheck at the end of the week so they can cover the mortgage, uh, so that they can save money to send the kids to school, and so they can uh, make those necessary uh, uh, payment commitments uh, to lead the kind of life that they are aspiring to. And without our taking action here, uh, they're going to continue to live under this cloud of uncertainty about our future, and people are going to continue to struggle uh, to find meaningful work. It all comes down to the individual and to families. It doesn't come down to some accountant's uh, balance sheet. It doesn't come down to some just gross number that's being talked about out there. It comes out down to the pain and the suffering that so many people have gone through in this last four years and are continuing to uh, encounter uh, if, because of our lack to take the necessary steps to go forward. Mr. President, I'm going to keep talking about this. I'm going to come down and talk about how we can potentially uh, to achieve a much leaner, more effective, and efficient government. I'm going to use as a model not just my state, but many states that have had the governors who have had the courage to step forward and do what is necessary to put their state in better fiscal balance. In contrast to other states that have, are doing what we're doing, and that is pushing the tough decisions down the road and trying to deal with it at another time. Uh, as we go through the federal budget, uh, there are literally hundreds of billions of dollars that are simply being spent in the wrong place, simply going to programs that are no longer effective and efficient if they ever were in the first place. We are not making priorities in terms of how we spend our money. Senator Coburn and I and others have been down on this floor talking about egregious examples of overspending, of over-bureaucracy, of programs that perhaps had a value uh, at one point in time, but is simply not doing the job anymore or not necessary. Talking about the kind of things that ought to be done at the state and local level rather than at the federal level. Talking about not having to promise people that uh, everything that we spend uh, uh, is for a vital national purpose. We need to do some serious triage here, some serious look at how we spend the taxpayer dollars. And we can come up with money to offset necessary programs. We can come up with money to lower the demands so that we don't have to continue to go out to the American people and say we have to raise your taxes one more time. Uh, we've said this too much. Uh, the burden here is not tax uh, revenues. The burden here is dealing with our spending issue. And part of that has to be dealing with the mandatory spending that is ever driving uh, this deficit and debt. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. President. Senator from Alaska. I request time to uh, make my statement as required. Senator has that right. Mr. 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 President, let me, I, I came down to speak on Violence Against Women's Act, but before I do that, I want to uh, I appreciate my friend from Indiana. Uh, we all want to get this budget under control. We all recognize we have to get this under control, not only for today's generation, but for multiple generations to come. You know, in the last few years, we've been able to take out almost $2 trillion uh, of our budgetary costs over the next 10 years through cuts that we have been able to accomplish in a bipartisan way here, but led a lot by this side here. But let me remind folks where we are. You know, we, we, four years ago, this economy was flat on its back, an economy that didn't have any air in it. Uh, it was in grave uh, situation. 
But where are we today? You know, we have a five-year housing starts, uh, incredible uh, uh, activity within the automobile industry. Again, record high sales going on there. The market, the stock market has doubled in the last four and a half years. Most recently, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, which when you uh, look at that office, it's a bipartisan office. It doesn't, you know, show any favoritism to any side. In four years, we have cut the annual deficit by 40 percent. Now, I know that's not where it should be yet because we want to balance it, but 40 percent reduction in the annual deficit is significant. So we are on the road. Is it a slower road than we would like? Sure. But it is on the road to recovery. It is having positive impact. Matter of fact, now the deficit is, uh, the amount uh, compared to our GDP is cut in half. So we were making some inroads. So I want to make sure, and I agree, I think Democrats are not afraid at all to cut the budget where it's necessary. But you need to solve this problem with three types of moves. You got to cut the budget, deal with revenues, and invest in this economy for education, energy, and infrastructure. It's a three-pronged approach. Anyone that thinks you can only do one of these and somehow magically $16 trillion debt will just vanish overnight is in another world that doesn't exist on this planet. So I appreciate the debate that goes on here, but we need to be honest, realistic, practical in dealing with these budgetary issues, and they will be tough. People will not like all the answers. I can see them now, my town hall meetings, when I go to them. They'll say, cut the budget, which we will do. Don't get me wrong, we will do that. But then when I go back to that same town hall meeting, they will say, well, I didn't mean actually that program. That will be the story, but the fact is, we have serious issues we have to deal with, so this is not a Democrat issue, it is not a Republican issue, so when people come to the floor, we should think about this as an American issue, that we have to resolve this for the right reasons, and we have done some exceptional work over the last four years, despite the hurdles, the political slogans and all the other stuff that goes along in getting results. 40% reduction in the annual deficit in four years is significant. Now, is it zero? Is it balanced? No, because it's been multiple years of 40 plus years of not paying attention to the budget. A lot of us are new around here. Matter of fact, the Senate is made up of 60% of the Senate is made up of people who haven't been here more than six years. Matter of fact, I'm looking at the three on the floor right now, us, you know, in the sense of the Senate. So we're here to solve this problem, but do not be mistaken. We have made progress. The American people should be proud of what we have done. But is it perfect? No. Do we have more work to do? Yes. That's why we're here. That's why we're going to do this in a bipartisan approach. But I wanted, I digress from when I came down here. I just, I like the debates that happen on the floor. I wish more would happen. But when a member speaks, I want to make sure uh, all the information is on the floor. Mr. President, I came down here to speak today on an important piece of legislation, Senate Bill 47, the Violence Against Women's Act. We debate, as you just saw here, lots of important issues around here. But not too often can we stand on this floor of this chamber and say our votes matter, matter in a way of life and death. In this case, it is absolutely true. This bill saves lives. It's our job to pass it now, today. The Senate, like we did last year, needs to send a simple an important message that America will not tolerate violence against its women, children, and families. We must do our part to reduce domestic violence and sexual assault. Even though the House has refused to act over 300 days since we sent the bill over there, now we're in a new session. There is a bipartisan support in this chamber. The VAWA bill passed the Senate with 68 votes last spring, and there are at least 60 of us already signed up and co-sponsoring this legislation. We know the reality. The fight to protect women and families from violence is far from over. VAWA was the first passed just 20 years ago and it hasn't been reauthorized since 2006. The law has made a difference. We know a great deal more about domestic violence than when VAWA was first written. Services for victims have improved. Communities offer safer shelter. Local, state, and federal laws are stronger. Yet there are still too many awful stories and inexcusable numbers, especially in my home state. Alaska continues to have some of the worst statistics in the country. 
Three out of every four Alaskans have experienced domestic or sexual violence or known someone who has. The rate of rape in Alaska is nearly two and a half times the national average, even worse for Alaska Native women. Child sexual assault in Alaska is almost six times the national average. Out of every hundred adult women in Alaska, nearly 60 have experienced physical or sexual violence or both. So you can see why I'm standing here today. We need to do something about this, not someday, not next year, today. In one typical day in my state, victim services agencies through Alaska serve an average of 464 victims. 114 hotline calls are answered. 300 people, 308 people across Alaska attend training sessions offered by local domestic violence and sexual assault programs. And yet, people are still turned away because of a lack of funding, a lack of service. On an average day in Alaska, 52 requests for services are not met. Basic needs such as transportation, child care, language translation, counseling, and legal representation. The bill before us today is critical in ensuring that all victims receive the services they need. Mr. President, I want to spend just a few more minutes discussing the safety of women and children, Alaska Native and American Indian families around the country. For the sake of our nation's first people, the tribal provisions in this bill need to become law. Yet some of my colleagues on the other side of this chamber are trying to strip out our expanded authority over domestic violence in Indian country. Why are we debating this? One out of every three Native American women have suffered rape, physical violence, or stalking. And yet some members want to debate the rights of their abusers. I fully support the tribal provisions in this bill. Yet, I must point out that none of the expanded criminal jurisdiction applies to Alaska Native tribes, except for one true reservation at the very southern tip of Alaska. Today is not the day to fight that fight, but I will take it up again soon from my seat on the Indian Affairs Committee in the Senate. Study after study has concluded that the lack of effective local law enforcement in Alaska Native villages contributes to so many problems, increased crime, alcohol and drug abuse, domestic violence and poor educational achievement. When it comes to protecting those most at risk, Congress must recognize the need for local control, local responsibility, local accountability. This bill will take a big step forward today on Indian reservations in the lower 48. At a later time, we'll get to my bill, which I've introduced in the past as the Alaska Safe Families and Villages Act. My bill would establish small demonstration projects so a handful of federally recognized tribes in Alaska's villages can take action. They would be allowed to address domestic violence and alcohol-related cases within their villages and village boundaries. Our native villages are vibrant, resilient communities, and we must answer their calls for help. That includes all of the above, approach to combating domestic violence and abuse. The one thing we know for sure is the status quo is not working. It's not just about slogans or feel-good statements. We need to act. But for now, for today, let's vote on VAWA and get this bill passed. Let's protect women and children and families all over this country. And let's send a strong message to our colleagues in the House that this time, there's no hiding. It's time to get the job done. It's time to put politics aside, pass this bill, and truly save lives. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from New Mexico. It does, um, it, yeah. the Senator uh, from Iowa, Senator Grassley, are you, are you, uh, are, are you in the queue to speak? That's what I, excuse me? If I could have about seven or eight minutes now. Sure. No, you're in the queue because uh, Senator Begich just spoke, so the, the, um, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Mr. President, 
Iowa. Uh, before I speak, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that Barrett Anderson, a fellow in my office, be given privilege of the floor during the debate and votes con concerning S-47. Without objection, so ordered. There has long been bipartisan support for Violence Against Women Act. Too many women are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and dating violence. Federal support for services to these women, and sometimes even men, has been beneficial to our country. I support many of the provisions in the majority bill. There are consolidations of grant, cyber stalking, rural programs, assistance for individuals with disabilities, older victims, housing protections, and numerous other whole uh, provisions that I wholeheartedly support. There is overwhelming bipartisan support for 98 percent of what is contained in S-47. The process in Violence Against Women Act in the 112th Congress was very disappointing, and I expressed that last year during debate uh, on this uh, issue. Previously, Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized unanimously, I mean prior to the present debate last year and this year. When new provisions were added, as they were last year, they were consensus items. Uh, I want to say that again. When new provisions were added in the past pr prior to last year, they were consensus items. The law then was reauthorized by consensus. Something similar could have happened again last year, but it didn't. New provisions were forced into the bill. Some of these provisions were controversial. Some raised serious constitutional concerns. But those on the other side of the aisle insisted on these provisions without change and refused any sort of middle ground. It appeared that the debate was more about blame and politics than it was about providing help to women in need. Last Congress, both the Republican leader and this senator offered that the Senate consent to striking a provision that violated the Constitution's origination clause, and then we would proceed to conference. Uh, the, uh, everybody knows that the Constitution origination clause says that issues involving raising revenue must start in the other body. Well, this bill raised revenue and consequently uh, violated that constitutional provision. Yet today, Senate 47 has removed that provision that raised this blueprint, blue slip problem in the other body. It does this only a few months after the majority refused to drop it and proceed to conference. What I just said tells you if it had been done like they're doing it right now, we could have gotten this bill to conference and had something to the president in the last Congress. The willingness of the majority today to eliminate that unconstitutional provision demonstrates that we could have had a bill last year, and that is what I want to express to my colleagues as a terribly disappointing uh, proposition for this senator. It is not true that unless S-47 is passed exactly as is, various groups will be excluded from protection under the law. Current law protects all victims. Vice President Biden wrote the current law. Every member of the Senate who was a member of this body when the Violence Against Women Act last was reauthorized voted for that bill, which backs up what I've been saying several times during my remarks, that this could have passed last year as a consensus piece of legislation uh, and uh, has passed in, the, in, in other reauthorizations as a consensus piece of legislation. Uh, neither Vice President Biden nor any other senator passed a discriminatory bill in the past. It is uh, not the case that unless the controversial provisions are accepted exactly as the majority insists without any compromise whatsoever, that any groups 
will be excluded. The key stumbling block to enacting a bill at this time is the provision concerning Indian tribal courts. That provision raises serious constitutional questions concerning both the sovereignty of tribal courts and the constitutional rights of defendants who would be tried in those tribal courts. We should focus on providing needed services for Native American women. But S-47 makes political statements and expounds needlessly on Native American sovereignty. It raises such significant constitutional problems that its passage might actually not accomplish anything at all for Native American women, while at the same time failing to protect the constitutional rights of other American citizens. Now, even the respected organization of Congressional Research Service has raised constitutional questions about the tribal provisions in this bill. And I hope that whatever the Senate might do today, that negotiations on these questions will continue. I'm confident that if we can reach agreement on these questions, compromises on the other few remaining issues can also be secured, allowing the bill to pass with overwhelming bipartisan support. So following up on some of the concerns I've raised this morning, I will yet today, if possible, offer a substitute that is much more likely to be, to be accepted by the other body and then get to the president for signature. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from New Mexico. Mr. President, I, I rise today to express my support for the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. It's important that we're doing this early in the 113th Congress, and unfortunate, we have to have this debate again. The Senate passed a nearly identical bill last April, a bill with strong bipartisan support, but the House failed to bring it up for a vote allowing the law to expire at the end of last year. Many House Republicans opposed the Senate bill because it expanded VAWA protections to three groups, gays and lesbians, Native Americans, and undocumented immigrants. I support all three of these expansions. And today, I want to again stress how crucial this measure is to Native American women. For the past 19 years, the Violence Against Women Act helped protect Native women from domestic violence, from sexual assault, and from stalking. This historic legislation has strengthened the prosecution of these crimes, and it has provided critical support to the victims. VAWA has long been bipartisan with broad support. Democrats, Republicans, law enforcement officers, prosecutors, judges, health professionals, all have supported this legislation. Why? Because it worked. Since VAWA's passage in 1994, domestic violence has decreased by over 50 percent. And the victims of these crimes have been more willing to come forward, knowing that they are not alone, knowing that they will get the support they need, knowing that crimes against women will not be tolerated. Mr. President, unfortunately, not all women have received the full benefits of the Violence Against Women Act. That's why the tribal provisions now are so important. Native American women are two and a half times more likely than other U.S. women to be victims of rape. One in three will be sexually assaulted in their lifetimes. And it is estimated that three out of every five Native women will experience domestic violence. Those numbers are tragic. Those numbers tell a story of great human suffering, of women in desperate situations, desperate for support, and too often we have failed to provide that support. 
The frequency of violence against Native women is only part of the tragedy. Too often these crimes go unprosecuted and unpunished. Not only is violence inflicted, but justice is denied. Here's the problem. Tribal governments are unable to prosecute non-Indians for domestic violence crimes. They have no authority over these crimes against Native American spouses or partners within their own tribal lands. Instead, under existing law, these crimes fall exclusively under federal jurisdiction. But federal prosecutors have limited resources. They may be located hours away from tribal communities. Non-Indian perpetrators often go unpunished, and yet over 50 percent of Native women are married to non-Indians. Seventy-six percent of the overall population living on tribal lands are non-Indians. The result is an escalating cycle of violence. On some tribal lands, the homicide rate for Native women is up to ten times the national average. Ten times the national average. But this starts with small crimes, small acts of violence that may not rise to the attention of a federal prosecutor. In 2006 and 2007, U.S. attorneys prosecuted only 45 misdemeanor crimes on tribal lands. For perspective, the Salt River Reservation in Arizona, which is relatively small, reported more than 450 domestic violence cases in 2006 alone. Those numbers are appalling. Mr. President, Native women should not be abandoned to a jurisdictional loophole. In effect, these women are living in a prosecution-free zone. The tribal provisions in VAWA will provide a remedy. The bill allows tribal courts to prosecute non-Indians in a narrow set of cases that meet the following specific conditions. The crime must have occurred in Indian country. The crime must be either a domestic violence or dating violence offense or a violation of a protective order. And the non-Indian defendant must reside in Indian country, be employed in Indian country, or be the spouse or intimate partner of a member of the prosecuting tribe. This bill does not extend tribal jurisdiction to general crimes of violence by non-Indians. It does not apply to crimes between two non-Indians, of crimes between persons with no ties to the tribe. If they don't have any ties to the tribe, it doesn't apply. Nothing in this provision diminishes or alters the jurisdiction of any federal or state court. I know some of my colleagues question if a tribal court can provide the same protections to defendants that are guaranteed in a federal or state court. The bill addresses this concern. It provides comprehensive protections to all criminal defendants who are prosecuted in tribal courts, whether or not the defendant is a Native American. Defendants would essentially have the same rights in tribal court as in state court. These include, among many others, the right to counsel, the right to a speedy trial, the right to due process, the rights against unreasonable search and seizures, double jeopardy, and self-incrimination. A tribe that's, that does not provide these protections cannot prosecute non-Indians under this provision. Mr. President, some have also questioned whether Congress has the authority to expand tribal criminal jurisdiction to cover non-Indians. This issue was carefully considered in drafting the tribal jurisdiction provision. The Indian Affairs and Judiciary Committees worked closely with the Department of Justice to ensure that the legislation is constitutional. As a former federal prosecutor and attorney general of a state with a large Native American population, I know how difficult the legal maze can be for tribal communities. And one result of this maze is unchecked crime. The situations where personnel and funding run thin and distances are long, violence often goes unpunished. This legislation will create a local solution for a local problem. Tribes have proven their effectiveness in combating domestic violence committed by Native Americans but let me reiterate this very important point. Without an act of Congress, 
tribes cannot prosecute a non-Indian. Even if he lives on the reservation, even if he's married to a tribal member, without this act of Congress, tribes will continue to lack authority. Now, Mr. President, I would ask at this point to uh, insert the rest of my statement uh, into the record as if read. Without objection, so ordered. And Senator Leahy had asked that, that uh, I uh, put tribal statements in the record, so I would ask unanimous consent that these letters from tribal and other organizations in support of the tribal provisions in S-47, the Violence Against Women Act, be included in the, in the congressional record. Without objection, so ordered. And I know my colleague, the uh, senator from Minnesota, Senator Klobuchar, is here today. Uh, another prosecutor, another one who knows the importance of this law, and, and I uh, uh, very much appreciate her hard work uh, in terms of bringing justice to tribal communities and bringing justice uh, to women across this nation. Thank you, and I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Minnesota. Uh, Mr. President, I want to first thank uh, the Senator from New Mexico for his great leadership on this issue. This is a, a national issue. It's a bipartisan issue. It crosses geographic lines. And for those of us that have tribal communities, uh, significant tribal communities, uh, we know how important these provisions are to this bill. Uh, we tried very hard on the Judiciary Committee uh, to make sure that this bill has been consistent uh, with the bipartisan work we've done in the past, but we also saw it as an opportunity to consolidate some of the programs to save money and then to look at areas where we needed to be more sophisticated, where we needed to respond uh, to changing issues in the law, and certainly the tribal jurisdiction issue uh, was one of those major ones. Mr. President, I rise today to talk about the importance of this bill. It's a law that has changed the way that we think about violence against women in the United States of America. The Violence Against Women Act is one of the great legislative success stories in the criminal area in the last few decades. Since it was first passed in 1994, annual domestic violence rates have fallen by 50%. Now, you usually cannot say that with criminal uh, prosecution efforts. I usually don't have that kind of number, but that's what we have. Since 1994, 50% difference in domestic violence rates. People have stopped looking at the issue of domestic violence as a family issue, and they've started treating domestic violence and sexual assault as the serious crimes that they are. Last year, Minnesota recovered, re, last year, Minnesota recorded the lowest number of domestic-related deaths since 1991, down from 34 in 2011 to 18. This is in no small part due to the Violence Against Women Act. Women have more access to intervention programs. They feel more empowered to come forward. I know in my own county, where I was chief prosecutor for eight years, uh, thanks to the good work of Paul and Sheila Wellstone, uh, my predecessor, County Attorney Mike Freeman, uh, we set up one of the most unique domestic violence service centers in the country. It's been a model for the rest of the country. Uh, under my leadership, we also made changes to it to advance it to even higher levels. But the point is, is that it's a one-stop shop for the victims of domestic violence so that they can come in, see a prosecutor, see a cop, have a place for their kids to play, uh, be able to find a shelter and a place to live all under one roof instead of walking through the maze of the bureaucracy in the government center. Both the prevention and prosecution of domestic violence were among my top priorities as a prosecutor. And I know we've done good work, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. According to a recent survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 24 people per minute are victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner in this country. Approximately one in four women have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime, and 45% of the women killed in the United States are killed by their partner. Every year, close to 17,000 people still lose their lives to domestic violence. These statistics mean that sexual assault, domestic violence, and stalking are still a problem in America. That is why it is so important that we are moving quickly to take up this bill. 
Just like the two prior authorizations in 2000 and 2006, this bill strengthens current law and provides solutions to problems that we have learned more about since VAWA first passed in 1994. The Senate bill continues its tradition of bipartisan sponsorship with 60 co-sponsors, including seven Republicans. And as we know, last April, the Senate approved this bill for a 68 to 31 vote. All 17 women senators supported that bill. I see my colleague, Senator Murkowski here from Alaska. Uh, we thank her for her uh, support and vote for that bill. Uh, this has truly brought the women of the Senate together to stand up against domestic violence. What does this bill do that's different from the last bill? Well, it consolidates duplicative programs and streamlines orders. It provides greater flexibility for the use of grant money. It has new training requirements for people providing legal assistance to victims. And as I mentioned, it takes important steps to address the disproportionately high domestic violence rates in Native American communities. I am disappointed that we were unable to include the modest increase in U visas for immigrant victims of domestic violence. There were technical objections to including that provision, and so it was removed in order to improve our chances of getting this bill done once and for all. U visas are an important tool for encouraging victims to come forward, and I will press to increase the number of U visas available to victims when we work on this comprehensive uh, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill in the spring. One thing I wanted to note, Mr. President, about this bill is that it includes um, many gaps in the current system, uh, ways to improve the current system, and there was a bill that I introduced with Senator Hutchinson to address high-tech stalking, cases where stalkers use technology like the internet, uh, video surveillance, and bugging to stop victims. This is not something we would have probably been talking about if I was standing here in 1994. But here in 2013, uh, we know that it is an issue. We've seen cases across the nation of this kind of video surveillance and internet bugging. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had a very high-profile case uh, involving a uh, high-profile newscaster uh, who is willing to come forward uh, and work with House and Senate authors on this bill. Um, we are very pleased to have had the support um, for the Fraternal Order of Police, Federal Law Enforcement or Officers Association, National Sheriff's Association, International Association of Chiefs of Police have all endorsed this bill. This provision, the high-tech stocking provision, is included in the Violence Against Women Act. So we're very, very happy about that. Again, I believe that our laws have to be as sophisticated as those that are breaking them. If they're using the Internet, if they're spying with video cameras through peepholes, we have to be able to respond to that. I wanted to end by telling the story I told when we first started to consider this bill over a year ago. Last year ago, uh, over the holidays, I went to one of the saddest funerals I ever attended. It was a funeral for Officer Sean Schneider. Uh, he was a Lake City police officer in Minneapolis. I've since gotten to know his widow. He died responding, Mr. President, to a domestic violence case. He went up to the door. He had received a call from the 17-year-old victim, the department ad. He went up there to that door, and he got shot in the head. His bulletproof vest didn't protect him, nothing protected him. And when I was sitting in that church and saw his three little children, including that little girl in her little blue dress covered in stars, I thought to myself at that moment, you know, the victims of domestic abuse are not just one victim. It's an entire family. It's an entire community. So in their honor today, the honor of those children, I would like us to have a strong bipartisan support for the Violence Against Women Act. I believe we can do it. Mr. President, I thank you. I yield the floor. Letters from law enforcement and criminal justice organizations in support of S-47, the Violence Against Women Act, be included in the congressional record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Uh, Mr. President, I request permission to speak as if in morning business. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, um, first I want to follow my uh, colleague from Minnesota in voicing my support for passage of the Violence Against Women Act. 
Uh, as she noted, I have been a co-sponsor of this very important legislation, not only this Congress, but last. I have urged on multiple occasions that we move forward with reauthorization of, of this very significant legislation, have urged the House uh, to do the same last year. They failed to do that. Uh, you don't give up when the cause is right. And this is far too important to too many uh, around the country. My colleague has cited some of the statistics and the issues, the initiatives that she has worked on uh, when she was, was back home in her home state of Minnesota. This is something that I think we all share a concern for the levels of domestic violence within our respective states. In a state like Alaska, where we have so much to be proud of, unfortunately, our statistics as they relate to domestic violence are appalling. Appalling. And so anything that we can do, whether it's here in Washington, D.C., at the local level, the state level, we must do so. We need to act here. So I join uh, not only my colleague from, from Minnesota, but so many who have led the charge here to do right uh, as we work to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. Mr. President, I, I will uh, have an opportunity to speak more on VAWA and that reauthorization later, but I wanted to take some time this morning to come to the floor to, to speak about an issue that has absolutely inflamed me this week. This week, I learned that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior was going to make a decision, or has made a decision, to deny the construction of a single lane gravel emergency access road through a very, very, very tiny portion of a national wildlife refuge located on the Alaska Peninsula in southwest Alaska. Now you might think, well, why, why is this such a big deal? Mr. President, you've heard me come to the floor, um, or others here in this body have certainly heard me come to the floor many times to be an advocate on, on behalf of Alaska and development of, of our resources to benefit the people of Alaska, to benefit the, the, the country as a whole. This is not a development project that I'm talking about here today. What I am addressing today is the health and the safety, the safety of the residents of a small Aleut community located in the Aleutian Islands. 748 people who really don't have the audience that uh, so many constituents or so many constituents in Alaska or in other parts of the of the country enjoy they are kind of out of sight out of mind if you will but they are not out of sight out of mind out of my heart one of the most important responsibilities that we have as United States senators as members of Congress is to protect the safety of those people that we represent well today I want to to tell the story of King Cove, Alaska, and what's going on. You've seen the, the picture of, of the map of Alaska, uh, the big, beautiful state. I don't have it superimposed over the rest of the lower 48, because my point today is not to talk about how big we are in context to the rest of the nation as a whole, but to put in context what we're talking about here when we talk about the community of King Cove, Alaska. Got the Aleutian Peninsula here that stretches out a thousand miles. You might not appreciate the length and scope that we're talking about here, but the Aleutian chain is just exactly that. King Cove is right on the end of this, this peninsula area here in this diagram. So it's, it's kind of out there. And when I say kind of out there, there's nothing else around there. There are no roads that connect you to get anywhere when you want to go to, quote, town town is Anchorage, Alaska, about uh, probably, I don't know, about 600 miles, I would guess, away, uh, maybe even a little bit longer, probably a $1,000 uh, airplane ticket to get there, but that just kind of puts it in, in context here. So we're talking about King Cove, Alaska. To put it in, in a little better context as to, to what we're speaking about here, this is the community of King Cove, right on the end of this, this lagoon, this bay in here. 
All the way around the other side of the bay is an area called Cold Bay. Cold Bay was designated uh, during World War II as uh, a, 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 an air base that this country relied on. And during the war, they constructed a 10,000-foot runway. It's the second longest runway in the state of Alaska right now. And it's in pretty good shape. It is used as a, as a divert uh, runway. Um, NASA uses it as one of its divert places. It's a pretty good, solid airport. But over here in King Cove, and, and keep in mind, Cold Bay has about 100, maybe 100, 110 people on a good day that live in Cold Bay. Around the bay here, King Cove, is an Aleut community. It's been around for maybe a thousand years, maybe a couple thousand years. It's been around a long time. The Aleut people have lived in this part of the, of the country for thousands of years. And this community now is host to about 748 people, give or take. During the fishing season, you might get it up as high as, as possibly even a thousand people. But it's not, it's not a booming metropolis by any stretch of the imagination. But King Cove, as you can see, is, is, is kind of isolated here. You've got water all around of it. That's, that's fair. That's good. But you have, you've got a situation here where this community is ringed by mountains. And I've got a, a map, or not a map, excuse me, a picture here. We'll go ahead and just keep this one up. Um, picture here of, of King Cove. So when you look at where the water is and when you look at where the mountains are, it looks, these are pretty fjord-like. These are not timid and tame mountains. These are the types of mountains that get your attention when you are flying in. Because the, 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 the airstrip here for King Cove sits right back up in this area here. So you have to come through these high mountains on all sides. And when the cloud layer is low, as it usually is, in this area. Uh, you've got some issues as to whether or not you've got a, a safe flyout range. So you've got clouds. You have, you have um, not only cross currents that, that hit as you are coming into the airport, but you also have the downdraft coming off these very strong, very prominent mountains. Downdraft that causes turbulence that particularly impacts helicopters that might be coming into this community for, for a rescue. So again, as you, as you look at your options to getting in and out of King Cove, your airport sits about here. You're rimmed with, with uh, mountains. You can either fly in up this way or you can fly in out that way. But either way you cut it, you're moving through very high mountain, mountainous terrain with winds on all sides coming from above, clouds coming from below. It is as tricky and as difficult a navigational issue as just about anywhere in the state. And going back to, to where King Cove sits in, in the oceans here, you have weather that comes in off the Bering Sea up here. And you have weather that comes up from the Gulf of Alaska here. And they all kind of come together right around the Aleutians. The Aleutians are known to be one of the, one of the areas, at least in, in, in this country, of, excuse the expression, but we just call it snotty weather. It is foul weather way too many times of the year, not just in the winter. But we saw just, just last month the, uh, the incident with, with Shell's vessel trying to move from Unalaska across the Gulf of Alaska during January and encountering seas of up to, to 40 feet. This is the weather that we deal with in Alaska. So you've got, you've got difficult seas and you have difficult flying conditions. And yet you have people that call King Cove home and have for thousands of years. So you might ask why I'm spending so much time talking about the weather. It sets the stage for this action 
that the Department of Interior has taken and why I feel that this decision is so wrong-headed, so short-sighted, and so wrong, so wrong to the people who call this area home. It's talking about again the weather and what it means well when you are in a small community that doesn't have a hospital you don't have a hospital if there's 748 people we have an IHS clinic an Indian Health Services clinic and what we have there to provide for health needs is a is a, uh, a community health aid um, we might have a PA every now and again but not always reliably we actually did have a doctor out in King Cove uh, some years ago um, but that individual he was he was there back in 2006 he left after six months so we don't have the medical assistance that we need so when somebody suffers a heart attack when a a, a woman has a complication with a pregnancy it's not as if you can just stay there in King Cove and seek the medical help so what happens? They have to get out. Well, how do they get out? Well, you say, well, they can go out by boat. They can, they can move around by boat from here in King Cove over here to Cold Bay, where we have the second largest runway in the state of Alaska. It seems like a pretty simple solution. The problem is, is that a boat is about as dangerous, oftentimes, as flying. What happens? is if you've got weather that's this stinky, it raises the waves in here and getting a fishing vessel across with a sick person and trying to get them to, to the dock on Cold, Cold Bay side and out of that vessel is a harrowing event. We've got one picture here that we took off of, of a video that had been taken by the residents of King Cove. It might be difficult to see this, but what you're looking at here is, is a steel ladder, just a ladder going up the side of the dock. It's about a 20-foot area there. Way down at the bottom here, you can see the base of a fishing vessel. And what they're trying to do is to haul a sick elderly gentleman up this metal ladder in the rain and the sleet and the snow that's coming and you've got a boat that's pitching and heaving here and somebody up at the top of the dock ready to pick this individual up underneath their arms and haul them up onto the dock. This is not a condition that you want if you are feeling at all poorly. So I said, well, the fishing vessel isn't helping. Maybe, maybe we can do something else. So Congress back in, in 2005 said, maybe we could, maybe we could put a hovercraft there so it can ply the waters between this point here and Cold Bay over here because there is a road that can take you right along here, take you across to the water. The problem, not only the seas that wouldn't accommodate, but also the operational costs that were through the roof. It made no sense. And the people in King Cove and Cold Bay had acknowledged it was not going to make any sense. But they tried it, they were game, but it hasn't worked. And so what happened, what happened was action needed to be taken because we were seeing too many people whose lives were at risk. We were seeing too many people who were killed trying to get out in an effort to seek the medical help that they need, needed. At, at some point in time, you say, this, this just doesn't work. When you, have, when you have a way out, and it could be a simple road, why wouldn't we do that to address the life and the safety of the people who live here? Back in 1979, 1980, there were a number of airplane crashes that happened as they were trying to take off and land in King Cove. In 1981, we had uh, uh, a medevac plane go down. We lost a nurse, her helper, the patient, and the medevac's pilot were all killed. They were trying to, to airlift an individual out who had suffered a heart attack. Everybody's killed. In two, 2010, there was an airplane crash 
that uh, occurred while on landing into King Cove, Della Trumbull, who has long been, been an advocate for a solution to help the people of King Cove, was watching that plane land because her daughter was coming home. And to, to be sitting there at the airstrip, watching the plane come in to deliver your daughter, knowing that the weather is foul, knowing that the conditions are sketchy, and then seeing that airplane crash in front of your eyes. Now, fortunately for Della and her daughter, she walked away. But think about the trauma of that. In February of, of 2011, the Coast Guard was forced to dispatch a helicopter out of Kodiak. So, you know, you're, you're moving a helicopter from Kodiak over here to, to King Cove. They were trying to transfer out a 73-year-old woman who was suffering from chest pains. A few days later, the Coast Guard tried and failed to reach King Cove with, with a copter to airlift an 80-year-old woman who was also suffering chest pain. Fortunately, she survived. Two days later, there's another medical airlift that was delayed six hours from leaving. I just got the stats from, uh, from the Coast Guard from last year. How many, how many uh, rescue missions did the Coast Guard uh, take on to go into King Cove to help those who needed help because, not because the medevacs didn't want to go help or because it was going to be too costly, it was because the medevacs refused to go in because they will not take those risks. So what do we do? We call on our fabulous Coast Guard to come in and do the job five times last year. It's scary work. The Coast Guard does it and fortunately nobody was killed last year. But how many people need to be killed when you have an option for a road to get you to the second longest air runway in the state of Alaska? So let me share with others what it is that we actually did to address this problem. We said, you know what, this is not acceptable. And so five years ago, this Congress approved a land exchange. And in that exchange, the Aleut people and the state of Alaska agreed to give up 56,400 acres of prized waterfowl habitat. And they said, okay, we're going to give up 56,000 acres here to add to the Eisenbeck and the Alaska Peninsula National Wildlife Refuge. So we're going to trade this. And in return, the government will give back about 1,800 acres. Mr. President, do the quick math on this. This is a 300 to 1 exchange that the people agreed to. And it's even, it's even less when you isolate it. We're talking about 206 acres that are at issue here. 206 acres to allow for construction of a one-lane gravel road that will be used for no commercial use. This is to be used for emergency access. If you need to get out of King Cove because you've got some kind of a condition, all you would need to do is drive 20 miles. 20 miles. Think about it. We drive 20 miles to get from here to you know, wherever. We, we drive all the time. You don't think about it. We're talking about 20 miles to save people's lives. But it's even better than that because when we're talking about what we're putting through a refuge, it is about a 10-mile road through this refuge that we're talking about. And I even hate to describe it as a road. It is a one-lane gravel area through this lagoon that we're talking about. Non-commercial use. We've agreed to this. And in exchange for this 10-mile road, we've said we're going to give you 56,400 acres to add to a wilderness area. What a deal. What a deal. This is, uh, I, I hope that you can see this, because this is important to really understand what we're talking about here. This area in the black is, is what would be subject to the exchange. This is what is going into wilderness area. All of this here, plus other acreage that is not shown on this map, in exchange for these 
these red corridors there, about 206 acres. So back in, in 2009, we figured that here in this Senate and over in the House, it was important. It was important to address the safety needs of the people of King Cove. And if we could do that by allowing for a 10 miles, 11 miles of, of new road through the Eisenbeck Refuge, we could, we could solve a lot of problems here. And again, again, I reiterate, this road is specifically not allowed to be used for economic development. In the, in the omnibus bill that we passed, the language is specifically primarily for health and safety purposes and only for non-commercial purposes. So there were some who were so concerned that we were going to see a volume of traffic going back and forth between this community of 748 people and the 110 people that live over here that somehow there's just going to be this wild traffic going back and forth and it's going to disturb the, the migratory waterfall, the, the birds that come through here, the animals in this, in this refuge area. Well, Mr. President, I think it's important to recognize that this area is not, is, is not this, this area that has not been tracked by man, that it has not seen a presence. Again, I'll, I'll remind you, this was an Air Force base in World War II. This is the second largest runway in the state. This is an area that has seen traffic through, through vehicles, ATVs, uh, over the years because of the war. This chart here, if you can see the red tracks here, these are all the areas where all-terrain vehicle use is, is currently in play, and this has been in place since 2005, 2008. And then the areas that are kind of the red dotted are the predicted ATV vehicle travel corridors. So you can see this is, this is an, and this is all within the Eisenbeck refuge area, the wilderness area. So it's not as if this is, this is without any kind of, of access that is in place. If you look at this next picture that we've got here, this shows this is an example of, of what we're talking about with this proposed road. Um, you're out there in the middle of, of some pretty amazing sweeping um, landscape there. But the road is pretty much a one-lane gravel road. There is not going to be any stoplights, streetlights. There is not going to be any dividers, meridians, sidewalks. There is not going to be any overpasses. This is pretty much what we're talking about here. This next chart shows the existing trails that are currently uh, within the refuge area. Again, it's, um, it's pretty much a small, narrow, one track. Uh, it's not like you're going to be able to pass one another moving through, through the area. But the, the last picture that I want to show here is uh, just to give you kind of a, of a view of what the area looks like. It's amazingly flat. You are, in a, you are surrounded by a lagoon area. It is beautiful, absolutely. But these are all, these are roads that are currently in existence in the area now. So what we're talking about doing is adding, adding, about a 10-mile strip that would allow us to connect the roads that exist to the road that exists in Cold Bay, to connect a community who needs to have an emergency way out that is safe. They need to be able to connect to those who are on the other side of this lagoon. And the way to do it is a, is this simple road. Now, I, I've mentioned the concern about the waterfowl, and this is, this is where the Secretary of Interior called me and he said, I listened to the biologists, and the biologists tell me that the best way to respect this refuge is to not allow any road 
to not allow any road so that we can respect the refuge. And he listened to the biologists. But, Mr. President, the Secretary of the Interior did not listen to the people of Alaska. He did not listen to the people of King Cove. He did not even accept a meeting with them the numerous times that they have asked to meet with him. They have flown across country to make their case. But he listened to the biologists because he wants to respect the refuge. And instead, the lives of these people are not being respected. And if this is the attitude of this Department of Interior, that we are going to respect the animals and we are going to respect the birds, but we are not going to respect the people who live there, this is the wrong way to be going. This is the wrong way to be going, Mr. President, and I will not stand for it. Now, I want to make sure that we have refuge areas. I want to make sure that we have wilderness areas. And in this exchange that we adopted five years ago, we allow for that. We are we're putting in place wilderness area, the first new wilderness area designated by Congress in a generation. 45,456 acres of prime waterfall habitat added to wilderness in Alaska. But you know what? That's gone. Those lands will not remain in wilderness designation unless this road is permitted because the exchange is then going to be nullified if that road's not going to be built. So we've offered up a pretty sweet deal, a 300 to 1 exchange. In exchange for the safety of the people who live there, if you don't think that we can't build a one-lane gravel road that will allow for a coexistence, a coexistence between the waterfowl that migrate through there and the people that live there. You know, we, we've got another thing that we need to be thinking about. We, we will not have, we will not have a, a practical impact on the waterfowl in, in the refuge. Well, the, the land exchange involves 206 acres. Far less is actually going to be impacted by the construction. It's, it's far less than 1% uh, of the refuge. And again, the federal government is getting 300 times more land. It's just inconceivable to me that, that we would not be able to have a resolve that works for both sides on this. And for the, for the secretary to move forward with a designation that says no road, no road. It just, it, it is stunning to me. Now some might say, well, it's because it's going to cost us money here. There's no cost to the federal government, Mr. President. State of Alaska is going to be building this. Too many people have died for there to be any legitimate excuse for further delay. And I, I, I challenge those officials within the Department of Interior Come and visit King Cove. And don't necessarily come during the good weather, although the people of King Cove would tell you they're not entirely sure when the good weather is. But come. Come and see them. Come and see what we're talking about. I've been there. And to Secret uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes' credit, he too has been there. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate that others have tried and perhaps have not met with success because the weather didn't allow them in, because we weren't about to take a risk with them. Well, at a minimum, the Secretary of the Interior needs to be there, needs to meet with people, real people, like Carl Smith, a King Cove elder, an Aleut warrior. He was recognized as, as one of the amazing veterans. He's an Eskimo scout with the uh, territorial card. But look these people in the eye. Look these people in the eye and tell them that their lives are not worth as much as the lives of the birds, the black brants that, that inhabit the area. Now, it's not too late. While this decision has been, has been made coming out of Department of Interior, the secretary, or if the secretary Salazar is, is no longer there, his designee, they've got a legal obligation under this 2009 Act to base a decision on the road on what is deemed the public interest. 
And Mr. President, right now it seems to me that the, the Department of Interior has deemed that the public is made solely of, of birds and sea otters. My public, my public, Mr. President, is the real human beings that live in King Cove. So we need to make sure, we need to make sure that this decision is not based on an incomplete and a misleading EIS that concluded that with lives at stake, that no action was acceptable somehow. I will repeat, no action is absolutely not acceptable. I'm going to end my comments, uh, Mr. President, by letting you know what has happened in some other refuges. It was just a few years ago, we'll remember the uh, we were all transfixed by what was called the miracle on the Hudson. There was a commercial jetliner that hit a flock of Canadian geese, lost power, landed in the Hudson River. Uh, through the amazing skills of that pilot, nobody was harmed. Um, but what was the result of that? You might not have... The, have the Senator's time has expired. Request permission for one minute. Without